All right. This is the Y City Linux Talks presentation. My name is Brian Lundu. How many people have been here before? Cool. Oh. All right, this is kind of like last year's, but not really. This is a little bit different because a lot has changed in the general world of Linux over the last year, and it really pissed me off a few times, but we're going to talk about it. <laughs> so, this is my general disclaimer. We're all here because we like Linux, yada, 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 but it's all. <laughs> So, I'm kind of just going to jump right into it. <laughs> this makes no sense to me. In the last year especially, we've seen a number of, say, schisms within the Linux world, all revolving around the display server. So, X11, we can all agree, is old and busted. However, how many times in the old days did you have X11 configuration problems? All the time, right? I mean, there was issues where uh, several Ubuntu releases happened, X11 got updated, and everything got just screwed. That doesn't really seem to happen as much anymore. They've fixed so many of the problems that, well, X11, from our standpoint, from the user's standpoint, really isn't so damn bad. But just the same it is old and crusty. So along comes Wayland. Wayland's going to replace it, save everybody, make puppies fly, all that sort of thing. <laughs> And then along comes Mir. Oh, and then, and then, and then I don't know. I don't know what. Does anyone know why Mir is coming? Does anyone know why Canonical and the Ubuntu team are going to be using Mir? Specifically, can anyone tell me in one sentence why they need to use Mir instead of X11 or Wayland? And this is not in a harshing on Ubuntu or harshing on Canonical or harshing on the Mir project. I just simply can't figure out for the life of me what exactly is needed, what can't be done with some of the other projects. So that kind of confuses me a little bit. I, I'm going to take a little side break here and tell you a little story. When I was a kid, about six or seven years old, I liked to make forts out of blankets, pillows, chairs, TVs and stuff. What I like to do is I like to get a couple of chairs, line them up in a row, throw a blanket over them, and like drape the blanket over the top of the TV so I could sit in it and feel like I was in a cockpit playing video games on my TV and I got pillows all around. It was badass. So I had my friends over and we'd make forts together. One time I had two friends over. We all had very, very minor disagreements about who got to sit on which pillow because we had some really big pillows. Now, you could say, well, that's a pretty minor thing. Maybe take turns. Maybe just not worry about it. But what we did, because we were children, is we decided to divide and conquer, and we all basically forked our fort. <laughs> and in the end, I was left with a chair and a pillow. I had a friend who had two blankets, a chair, and a pillow. None of us could actually make a goddamn fort, because we were all working on something different. Instead of working on the same project that does 99.9% .9 of the same thing. And so we didn't have a cool fort. And that was the worst sleepover I have ever had. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and let you guys draw the parallels. <laughs> Here's a quote from the Fedora mailing, li mailing list. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably be packaged in Fedora 15. I think we're on Fedora 87 now. <laughs> now, this is not Fedora's fault. This is not like Fedora came out and screwed up Wayland really bad, and now we're not going to ship anything ever. It just simply didn't happen. Just something worth pointing out. So things get a little worse. So not only is the display manager forking all over the place, We've got the same problem with the general desktop environments. What the hell? This is a whole hell of a lot of different desktop environments. And if you look at it and you think about it, GNOME Shell and KDE Plasma were designed and developed to be as flexible as possible. Now, there are problems with them. Granted, a lot of problems with both. But they were both designed from the ground up to be extensible. Uh, GNOME Shell, you can make do just about damn near anything with a little bit of JavaScript. And yet, we have Unity. Yet, we have Cinnamon. Thank you, uh, Mint guys. And we have Mate, because some people 
just desperately don't want to utilize the other technologies that are actively developed. I, I just generally don't know why. And so this is my general philosophy here, that if we have something that works really easy and we can simply tweak it to meet our needs, let's fork it and create a completely new way to go. This sucks. This really sucks. Now, granted, I don't use GNOME Shell and KDE Plasma as my default desktop usually. They're good. I don't really use them. I use other stuff. I use things like Xmonad and the Awesome Window Manager, which like 1% of Linux users even know what the hell they are. But they're awesome. So that doesn't really apply to me. But when I look at it, and I look at all of the massive amount of work, look at Unity. Look at how many developers Canonical is paying to work on that. And it is good. They have created some really good stuff. But instead of working on, say, GNOME Shell or a version of KDE Plasma, they're working on Unity. And it gets even worse than that. They've built a couple versions of Unity now. What, how many, so Unity originally was GTK, and then, and then there was a QT fallback, and then Unity 2D. Right, there's the 2D version. Yeah. And now, and now, then they're like, no, no more QT 2D. It's just the GTK version. We got rid of the fallback version. Oh, but, but, but now we're gonna scrap all of that. We're gonna make it all in QML. And it's just like, okay, guys, Damn it! Stop it! It hasn't even shipped a usable version yet. Let's go ahead and fix it first. Now granted, uh, the most recent release of Ubuntu Unity is a hell of a lot better, but it just keeps happening. Not only are we working off and creating new projects that do, again, 99.9% of .9 the same damn functionality that those things do, we're rewriting it over and over again. So we're forking ourselves. Unity is several forks of itself. And the same problem goes with Cinnamon, sort of. Cinnamon is basically solving a problem that they've invented themselves. They want to create a user experience that is similar in some ways to what they were able to accomplish with GNOME 2. Great, except it was already accomplishable with GNOME Shell, at least 99.99% .99 of the way there. With a little bit of work in the GNOME Shell team, or in the GNOME team, they could have gotten all the way there, and we wouldn't have Cinnamon. We wouldn't have made either. This is what it was a couple of years ago. We were looking at desktop environments. This is what mattered. Like, like, you know, like the mid-90s all the way through like 2010. There was GNOME, there was KDE, and then there was all of that other crap. Like this 2% was like Xmonad and Awesome and uh, weird little fallback ones, or XFCE or LXDE. All these little things that were cool and as Linux nerds we probably <coughs> used, but most Linux users never even heard about. That's how it was. And this was a really easy story to sell to people. We could go out and say, you know what, you should try Linux. I'm like, great, which Linux should I try? I'm like, well, you know, there's some options. Once you settle on a distro, you choose between GNOME and KDE. They look a little different. You like Windows 95? Well, use KDE. You want something a little different? Oh, well, you like Macs? Try GNOME. It was an easy marketing message to pitch. I liked that. <laughs> we could tell people what to use. When people came up to you, you could say, this is what I recommend. This is where we are today. With the forking of everything, along comes Unity. Usually takes 20% of the pot. Cinnamon comes along, it takes 20% of the pot. The weird ones up here, uh, my colors aren't the same from chart to chart, but the weird ones ended up getting a big boost. More people are using XFCE and LXDE than ever before. Uh, it, it, they're just bigger than they were. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily development's going a lot faster, but they're getting a lot more usage. Uh, Lubuntu, uh, the LXDE basically respin of Ubuntu, is getting extremely popular. I'm running it on here. I've never used LXDE before Unity, Cinnamon, and everything came along, other than to just review it and play with it. It was cool. So this is the story now. Now when someone comes up to you and says, great, which desktop environment should I run? I don't. Uh, Brian, is, quick note, Wayland was in Fedora 15. I just checked the package results. Yeah, but usable... It, well, no, but it was packaged. The message just said it was packaged. It didn't say it's going to be working. Okay, okay. <laughs> 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 you can't, you're absolutely right. Wayland was in Fedora 15, just not usable. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so this is where we're at right now. I think we know what it is. We're duplicating a ridiculous amount of effort. A ridiculous amount of effort. Even if you just were to say, okay, uh, Unity, Cinnamon, Mate, uh, No Shell, and KDE, just the main ones, uh, that is basically five distinct, complete organizations filled with testers, developers, artists, 
uh, technical writers, marketing individuals, user evangelists that are focusing their efforts in completely different areas that do things like push a button, launch an app, here's a file manager. That is 90% of what we use our desktop environments for. Everything else is fluff. I don't mean that in a bad way, I love fluff. I love fluff so much. I like it when things have drop shadows and little spinny cubes. I love that stuff. But the core of what we need is being duplicated, uh, and the effort is being duplicated, which means we are making less progress. It means that we are spinning our wheels because there is no way in Sam Hell in two to three years that chart will look the same. The list of desktop environments that we simply can just have on our systems will not be the same. It wasn't the same two to three years ago. It won't be the same two to three years from now, which means a significant portion of the people working on those projects will have wasted all of their time. Especially the GTK Unity guys. <laughs> Especially the GTK <laughs> Unity guys. <laughs> now, the other thing is we're bringing things that work. A lot of things that work. Unity is a great example. Unity was working. It was a little slow, a little, a little buggy, but you fix bugs. You optimize and make performance better instead of porting and forking completely. Or like Cinnamon. Gnome Shell works. No, it's a little slow. Uh, it was a little buggy, but they kind of fixed a lot of that. Oh, okay, well, let's fork it completely and create Cinnamon. So we'll take something that was working and break it. That doesn't seem like a good thing to do. That's bad. We're also having significant user base fragmentation. Right now, raise your hand if you're using Unity. Okay, well, I don't know, 15, 20% of you. Raise your hand if you're using cinnamon. Okay, only a couple of you guys. KD? Man, you guys are all over the map. Gnome shell? Yeah. <laughs> See, we haven't even gotten into the weird little ones yet. <laughs> We're evenly freaking divided. We're an evenly divided camp in multiple ways. As a user base, we are fragmented. So that means when you go to a user group meeting and you try and talk to people about what's awesome about Linux, we're all going to be talking about different things and showing them entirely different systems that in no way resemble each other. Other than they can all, other than they can all run Firefox and Chromium. That's the, that's the only difference. That's the only thing that's similar. <coughs> and that's, that's just a terrible place to be from a marketing perspective. Now, there's a lot of good things about that, but I don't care about that right now. It just <laughs> simply is annoying. And again, developer fragmentation is bad, market problems are bad. Um, I don't have a clue what to use. I, I don't know what to tell people to use. People have come up to me in the, in the conference hall here just yesterday saying, what OS should I use? Well, there's a lot of great options. There's a lot of great distros out there. That's a pretty easy one. But what desktop environment should I use? Should I use Gnome Shell or KD? Uh, should I use Cinnamon? Uh, I don't know. And that's, that's coming from someone who lives and breathes this. I, this, is what, I mean, this is what a lot of us spend our lives doing, and yet there's no real good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of a neat chart. Uh, I kind of worked on this chart in all the sessions I've done over the last couple of years, and it's awful. Uh, now, I'm going to be very honest. I intentionally made the color scheme terrible. <laughs> It, it amused me a lot, so I had to do it. Um, but what we've got going on here is the basic tops. And this is all, these are all numbers that come from DistroWatch. So granted, I know, <laughs> these are not the end all be all of user numbers. This does not properly represent the exact user base. However, what it does do a good job of representing is within the Linux community, what is the general level of interest of any particular distro. It doesn't represent how many people have downloaded it. It also doesn't represent how many people use it actively. But it tells you the mind share. It tells you what people are thinking about. And it's all over the map. And I want to actually, let's simplify this a little bit. Because I want to talk about this. Because it's crazy. This line here. This is when it's mixed. What the hell? <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. I mean, think about it. Now, we saw back in with Warty Warthog in 2003, 2004, we saw the meteoric rise of Ubuntu. It clobbered. I mean, it absolutely just destroyed everything in terms of mind share. Now, it did this. Now, look at what's happened since then. Now, that's not talking total numbers. That's not talking, because the Linux user share is growing over the years. But in terms of percentage mind share, Ubuntu keeps dropping down. Linux Mint shot through the roof and eclipsed it. 
Red Hat has continued its steady decline over the years. Over the last 11 years, Red Hat has gone way, way down, but still maintains a pretty dominant position. Uh, actually, the one that always just amazes me is Arch. Look at this sucker. It like, gains like a one percentage point every friggin' year. It just continues, which means by the year 3000, nobody will be running anything but Arch. <laughs> <laughs> Could yeah. Verizon Linux Mint have anything to do with the fact that it's a lot easier to run on a mobile platform than Ubuntu would be? There's a lot of reasons why Linux Mint is shooting through the roof. Uh, I think a lot of it is look and feel stuff. A lot of it is polish and whatnot. I, there's a lot of reasons why Linux Mint has shot so high up. But uh, no. I'm going to focus on a few other items at the moment. Uh, the other thing to take, take note of here is, is SUSE. So now SUSE has been up and down, up and down, up and down. But what's kind of interesting about this sucker is how freaking consistent it is. It's like the one main distro that is maintained within a five percentage point mind share over the last 13 years, 11 years, since, since basically since distro watch has been tracking these sorts of things. And that's fairly, <laughs> fairly <laughs> remarkable. Uh, now let's, let's, let's take this a step further. I'm getting somewhere with this. Now these, these are really the basics. If we distill everything down to its core, to what it really is uh, under the hood, whether it's Debian-based or Red Hat-based. I, I broke out OpenSUSE because I still think it's remarkable that it just hovers above the 10% line always, which is <laughs> crazy to me. But, but check those numbers out. Now, it's, it started to kind of correct itself over the last year, a very small amount. But Fedora was king. When you used to talk about Linux, you talked about Fedora. People thought Red Hat was Linux. I mean, this is what people thought. Now, I mean, you could go to the stores, you know, in this range here, and you could buy SUSE in a box, and it was awesome. I think it was like SUSE 6, you could get in this big, perking box and give a manual. It was rad. But during that time, even when that was happening, Fedora was king. They ruled the roost. And then out of nowhere comes Debbie. Now, when I say out of nowhere, because Debbie's been around forever, right? But out of nowhere, it eclipses it. And it takes the user share away. And Fedora really hasn't fully recovered since then. Now, granted, Fedora-based distributions still represent a good 30% of the mind share of all Linux distributions, which is not insignificant. Unless you start thinking about Arch again. <laughs> then it's just catching up to it. And Fedora still has a trend that's gone from, say, 45% to around 30% over the last decade, which is, if you were a for-profit company, would be a problem. Now, pretty well over the last Agreed. We'll get to that in a moment, actually. <laughs> we'll hold on to that one. So now, all that in mind, let's talk about package management and how it relates to user share. I'm going to ask the audience, give me one really good reason why we don't have one single package format and package management tool. Because yeah. changing over would be a huge yeah. effort, which is not worth it. Okay. That's no point. <laughs> That's not a good reason. We, we broke the display server. Yeah. We broke the display server, the desktop it. environment. It's really difficult. It's wired into everything. It would just take so much effort. And what would we benefit from? So, so you still couldn't run the same so, package on Ubuntu and Fedora. So change is hard. Mm. Change is hard, but it's, change it's is very hard. It's a cost benefit, right? What's the benefit of having a single package? Well, like, you can't run the same package on two distros. But ah, you can. So here, you can. Here's where it starts to get interesting. So the point you're making is you can't run the same package Form a package on multiple distros, even if you're using the same format. You can now, it's not safe. You, but, theor but theoretically, you can. And you know what's proved Linux it? Linux standard base. You know what proved it? So we have we have multiple things that have proved it. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Up here in the guy with the mustache. <laughs> All right. Every distro that big companies pay money in the world for use the same packages yes. for either enterprise yes. distribution. Exactly. So let's look at Ubuntu and SUSE for a second. SUSE has you know, uh, OpenSUSE and the thousands. How many how many appliances have been built with SUSE Studio over over the last few years? Millions. Millions. So okay. Now they're all utilizing in many many cases they're all utilizing the same or similar repositories. So there are some additional similarities beyond simply the package format itself. But all generally quite compatible with each other in terms of packages. The same is true as happening with Ubuntu. There's a hell of a lot of Ubuntu respins. In most cases, you can take an Ubuntu package and run it on Mint just fine. 
in most right, editions. Because they share a common base. That's why because all the they editions share can share the same a common base. Exactly. But they don't. Fedora, Fedora. and Zeus don't share a common base. They, they don't. Do. Well, go down to the phone. One package. <laughs> <laughs> Are we done, Susan and Fedora? <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing that I'm saying. With Susan and Fedora being quiet, anyone else can give me a single good reason. Really good reason. Because philosophic, yeah, I'm not a programmer, but what I can do is better than what you can do. Yes. Now tell me how you can do it better. I don't know, because I'm not a programmer. <laughs> you can't talk anymore either. Anyone else? <laughs> I'm not really answering the question as much as I'm done with you. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it, therefore it's better. End of story. No. That's no, not what it says. <laughs> 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 the package is still saying that. It's a process. We're arguing about package formats. Okay, so choice above everything else. Choice is good, right? We like having choice. We like having the differences. Let me ask you guys this. What can you do, package format aside, on Fedora that you cannot do on Debian? The, tell me one thing that you can do. Smart Alfie comments aside. As a user, as a user, what can you do? What can you do that's different? F Fedora, tell me, what can you do with Fedora because of its choice of package format, if you can? that you can't do somewhere else. And I'm not saying this because Fedora's bad. It doesn't thing. matter to users. This is the point I'm making. At the level you're functioning at, changing package format makes no difference to you guys. But the thing I, the point I wanted to make about package format is that it's not the packages. They don't say, the RPM guys don't say, we're better than dev. And the dev guys don't say, we're better than RPM. If you talk to the guys who write the packages, yeah, they, they don't do. care. <laughs> they totally do. <laughs> Which <laughs> RPM developers are you talking to? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's not RPM the Red Hat loses. No, so, so here's the thing. I, I literally just pulled that name out of my butt. I was going to be specific, Ted. The reality is, we're at a position right now where if you go to Fedora, things work. You can install packages, it's great. Susan, things work. Debian, things work. We have people maintaining both. The base functionality of what they do is exactly the same. But it's built totally differently. It's Fedora built totally different. Totally different. Libraries from yes, this is exactly the point I'm making. They are built because they're different. different distributions. If they use the same right. set of libraries, they'd be the same distribution. So you've answered a completely different question. They wouldn't be different distributions. But not the question I was trying to ask. So here's here's what I'm getting at. We've got all of these things: desktop environments, display managers, package formats. We're going all over the place to recreate the same functionality. Now, in some cases, it's maintained functionality that's already been created. Why? Now, if you were, let's say, Microsoft, if you're Microsoft and you make Windows and Windows CE and Windows Embedded, do you want to have a different installer format for each? Now, Microsoft has in the past. They've had different installer formats for each. And how did it work out? Super duper bad. One was king, the rest of them blue. That's how that worked out. And in the end, Microsoft was like, oh, well, we, we need to start consolidating our platforms a little better. Now, they've done a very questionable job of that over the years, but that was the decision that was made. Now, when we start looking at Linux distributions, how many people does it take to simply repackage it? Assuming we never have to touch RPM and the related tools again. Never have to touch apt-get and, and the Debian package format. We don't have to touch any of them again because they're perfect and will never need to be even recompiled people required to package and test all of these packages. How many packages are in SUSE? Any idea? In what? Packages in, in OpenSUSE. In OpenSUSE? Yeah. Give or take. 13,000. 13,000. Those have to be built by somebody. No. No. <laughs> they do. So what you, you can automate things to a certain extent, but you still have to test. You still have to make sure things are packaged properly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right, Fedora snarky man. <laughs> you guys get what I'm coming at. But yeah. Okay, so uh, distributions are doing a lot of packaging of the open source. But yes. When you get out of that, when you go to, to Google to download Chrome, they have a dev yep. that works on Debian and Ubuntu, 
and yes. Mint and whatever, and they have an RPM that yeah. works on Fedora and OpenSUSE. Right. Yeah. So you go to Spider Oak, it's the same thing. Right. You go to now, you know, now there, there is the thing. Other places, you see the same kind of thing. They're not doing for every distro. They've managed to take advantage of either Debian or LSB. And that helps. Well, it's 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 and that helps. And that helps. And that helps. And that helps. Granted. It's just a giant. You're a big guy. Could you say Fedora and Susan be quiet for a minute? <laughs> Here's the problem I've got right now. The Fedora and Susan guys in the audience are guys I like quite a lot. They're both very smart and very right about what they're saying. Shh. <laughs> You'll be our standing for Let's arch. move on for a moment here. Let's move on to something a little less controversial. Let's just talk about these names for a second. These are the current names for the, the code names. <laughs> Let's talk about monetization. These are specific, these are numbers from uh, from the last couple of months for games and applications sold through various mechanisms on this. Uh, the number one application, the Ubuntu Software Center, sold 150 copies in a month. I, I think he sold it for two dollars, three dollars per copy. So as you can tell, he's living high on the hog. <laughs> now, uh, so I made a game called Linux Tycoon. Uh, it's the number 10 app in the Ubuntu Software Center. I sold 23 copies. <laughs> the number 10 application sold through the Ubuntu Software Center sold 23 copies. I sold for five dollars. <laughs> so I'm eating a lot of really cheap McDonald's. <laughs> So, now if we look at this, there's good and bad here, but let's look at the bad. That's 150 to 23. That means everything in between sold somewhere in between that. And if you didn't make it into the top 10, you got nothing. You got nothing. Now, I have other software in the Ubuntu Software Center, too. Guess how many, uh, so I make a visual development tool called Illumination. Guess how many it sold during March through the Ubuntu Software Center? Zero. <laughs> I would love to say zero because it's a better story and it's, it's more dramatic during the Linux launch time. But it did sell one. 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 Now, ironically, it is more expensive, so it made about half as much money as Linux Tycoon, but still, it sold one. 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 That's it. Which means that those sales numbers not only are not enough to sustain active development of anything, but it's not enough for most developers to make it even remotely worthwhile. It is in fact so much so bad that we'd be talking about just for packaging it and testing it on the platform, you're talking about maybe a dollar an hour for making a living. That is, I don't know about you, but what's minimum wage where you guys live? Like 10 bucks? Something like that? So one tenth of minimum wage to be a software developer if you do it that way. Now, granted, there's other software ways to sell, such as Steam. Steam launched a huge splash. When they launched, they did this big, massive sale that they promoted on the front page of Steam's website, where they're like, Linux, we have Steam on friggin' Linux, and this is awesome. Defender's Quest, a quite good game that sells quite well. Not billions of copies, but enough to make a good living for the developers. During that huge sales event, which I don't know if anyone may make software and sells it for a living, but when you do a sale, that's when you make like 80% of your sales and your income. They made 335 sales during a week-long massive sales event hyped from one of the biggest game companies in the history of mankind. <laughs> now, to be fair, this is more than the Mac version sold during the same period. But really, are we going to compare against a Mac as a gaming platform? No one uses a Mac to play games anyway. I know, I know, I know. They just don't. So, you know, why even compare against it? So, but the thing is, only 335 copies sold during a major sales event on one of the most hyped software launches in the last several years. I mean, how many people downloaded Steam when it came out for Linux? Like half of you guys. That's huge. Nobody has that sort of adoption except for like maybe Flash on Windows platforms. Right? Like nobody gets those sorts of numbers. Dead. And yet, this is what we get. We get 335 copies sold. And when this happened, sales of games through the Ubuntu Software Center dropped to four. Because why would you buy it through the Ubuntu Software Center? We can buy it through Steam and then run it on multiple platforms, on multiple Linux distributions, and that's awesome. 
But again, the sales are so low, you can't make a living off of it. That kind of sucks. What do you want, Susan? But they didn't launch any new games. No, but, no, no, they did. There was a couple of new games that launched during the time, but they weren't AAA titles. They had a bunch of free stuff, too. So they did have a bunch of free stuff. People were just going to grab the free. They did have some free stuff. Right. Well, and check it out with some free things. But again, I saw a dozen cool games that I'd already played through to the end. No, that's true. They did have a lot of cool stuff. But again, if you're a Linux user, you want to support that, right? I mean, so I bought a couple of games through Steam in part because I was afraid that if we didn't all buy like a game or two, and granted, most of the games I picked up were like five bucks, but if we didn't buy a game or two, that this was just gonna go away. This magical unicorn that just came in the room was gonna turn around and walk away and Gabe Newell was gonna kill it with a big hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't wanna see that happen. And that's not where we're at right now. They're making sales, their downloads are incredibly good for the base platform, it's not going away but the sales of individual games at the store are still quite, quite small. Uh, this generally bodes true. I include these numbers here because these numbers are all publicly available. Um, uh, the numbers I've gotten from some of the other game developers that are out there in the private are really roughly on par, a little above that, a little below that, but pretty similar. So what about donations? This is what's happened over the last four years with our door, which is a big audio editing suite. These are how many monthly donations they have in recurring subscriptions. The idea is that the guy who makes this piece of software lives off of this, or at least mostly lives off of this. So he can build this big, multi-track, quite awesome audio editing suite. So we went from, in 2010, he was bringing in about $2,500 a month. Go ahead and do the math on how much that is per year. See how much lower that is than your yearly salary. Um, <laughs> and went down. It was about 2000 something in 2011, and then this happened and made me cry a little bit. It went back up a little bit here, but we're still at minimum wage ish. Minimum, no, 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 lower than minimum wage. At least in Washington State. At least in Washington State. So this, this is what I'm saying. Now, granted, now they also sometimes do kind of the equivalent of pledge drives to kind of jack the numbers up a little bit to try and make ends meet. But what we're talking about here is highly trained, excellent developers trying desperately to make ends meet. And this is the best we were able to do, and that was three years ago, almost four. That's where we're at. So this is a snapshot I take every year, right around this time, I've included numbers from this project, because I find it interesting. And so these are the numbers from roughly, you know, March, April. Every year, it's, it's significant. Overall, the trend is like this. And this is terrible, because it's an incredible piece of software. And I don't bring this up because I feel like people need to go donate to Ardour. I, I wish people would, because the guy does an amazing job. But in general, this sort of thing happens. Now, a couple of, a year ago, I tried to make a thing where I released all of my software open source. I make my living selling closed source software, mostly for Linux, which I know is a little bit of an oxymoron. But I tried to do the same thing that he was doing. Let's get some subscriptions going. Let's get some recurring, you know, people paying so that I can release this stuff as open source. It failed so spectacularly. It was a gigantic explosion of suckball. It was <laughs> awful. Now, and that's not because the community sucks. It's not because, you know, I released some crappy software. I make my living right now selling the exact same software, all proprietary, but I make a good living off of it. Mostly, through Linux users, mostly through people like you guys, who buy my software, download it for Linux, run it on their Linux desktops, and they're cool with it being proprietary. The moment, and you guys, I have no commentary on this, I'm simply gonna put it out there. The moment I said, here is the source code, this sort of thing happened to me, and it shot way down. I have no comment. I don't understand. The, the logic behind it doesn't make sense to me. Because I would love to. How many people here work on proprietary software? It's cool. Don't be shy, guys. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of us. Wouldn't you love to be able to make it open source software? I mean, you'd love to do it, right? It makes you feel good. How many people who work on open source software? Feels good, right? Right, Fedora? It feels good. Would you prefer to keep it open source than make it closed source? Of course. As soon as I said the words, open source, <laughs> I hate that. I, I hate it. It's, but it's people. I used to work for Mendrick. 
I used to work for men. <laughs> but it's it's terribly sad. But it's a state of there's multiple things at play here. Maybe it's maybe it's the mindset we've all got. Well, you see the word open source. We don't want to pay for it anymore. Maybe it's the mechanisms that are in place for the ways in which we fund open source. Maybe. Now you could say, well, what about a Kickstarter campaign? There's a guys that make a development suite uh, over in London called Live Code. I don't know if any of you guys have watched this much at all. Um, it's a kind of it's kind of like a uh, hypercard. <laughs> anyway, it's kind of cool, right? It's this cross-platform suite. They decided they want to release it as open source, big closed source stack. They wanted to make a community version all open source. So what they decided to do was they decided to do a Kickstarter, right? And it worked. They raised like three hundred something thousand dollars to port it to open source and fund it's developed that way. What happens when it runs out? <laughs> Here's the problem that we come up against. We can do a gigantic yearly pledge drive sort of system and turn all software into basically PBS, where every six months we shut down and say, give us money or we die. <laughs> <laughs> Is it going to be on public but access? Then we don't know. <laughs> but then we don't know if we're going to have a job next year or six months from now. As a developer, as testers, as artists working on great software, we need to know that we can say, make a plan. We can make a three-year plan. Like, OK, here's our sales. We know how we're going to make this awesome over the next three years. And if we don't have a steady, reliable way of income, we can't make those plans, which means the software doesn't get big time better. We get little incremental improvements, because the companies and the individuals doing it simply can't afford it. It is impossible to do. Now, it sucks. Uh, you know, it's, what the solution is to this, I don't know. There was a time when I thought maybe all it would take was for big companies like Canonical and whatnot to release a great store. And then we've got it, right? They release a store and install it by default, and then we can browse it, and everyone can sell this cool commercial software. We're golden, and it didn't work. <laughs> All right, I want to talk about mobile. These are dead platforms, essentially. Mano, Migo, Moblin, uh, kind of the same in a lot of ways. WebOS, OpenMoco. Anyone remember the OpenMoco phones? Those were badass. They were, they were, OK, it was, a, it was the first time we had a phone. They created this phone called the Neo Free Runner. It had the word free in the title. Um, it, it was this tiny little touchscreen phone. It was kind of ugly, but it fit in your pocket. But anyway, it was running a full Linux stack, and it was open source. It was open hardware. It was open hardware design. I mean, it was great. They even made it so that you could swap out the boards later on and get like newer, upgraded boards to stick in your case. How cool is that? Dead. Limo. Anyone know what Limo is? Linux Mobile. Anyone know what that means? Like what it was? No one does. Yeah, it was an industry alliance. Again, dead. So here's where we're at right now. These aren't ancient platforms. These are all within the last five years. Within the last five years, all of those platforms looked like they were going to be big. When we sat around, like uh, when I was doing the Linux Action Show, we were talking. We talked about all these things. Every single one of them got us excited. Like, hell yeah, Amigo's coming. We, this is going to be awesome. Lionel. Yeah, Lionel. Linux mobile desktop, or Linux mobile phones, great. Dead. The only one that's really taken off at all is Android. Now, it's kind of debatable as whether or not Android is even really Linux for us, right? I mean, I mean, yeah, it's, it's mostly open source, but it's really just like a Java software stack sitting on a Linux curve, right? So it's more of a Java phone than anything else. It is cool. I have an Android phone. I really like it. But that's kind of where we're at. With all of these attempts, they die. And here's where we're at right now. We've got a bunch of touch plasma with, with Mare and Tizen. Firefox. 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 Firefox, so uh, So, okay. <laughs> so I, I am a big fan of Linux on mobile devices. Huge big fan. I, that guy right there is taking a video with my N900. That thing is old and ancient and busted, but I can, I, I, I was root in there right now. I can hop into my bash shell. I can app get whatever I want. It's bitchin'. But it's old. It's busted. It didn't sell well, and the company abandoned it because apparently Windows Phone is cool. This is the problem we're coming up against. Based on our track record, and when I say our, I mean us, all of us, the Linux world, because this is not just the company's fault that these are dead. The fact that these are dead is our fault. It's my fault. It's your fault with the cool beard. 
We, we didn't buy into these. We looked at them. Some of us bought a phone. You know, going on odds, maybe two or three of us would buy like a WebOS phone or a, or a Mamo phone or things like that. I bought one. It's not enough to support an ecosystem. It's not enough to support a small ecosystem, which means their companies, the organizations behind it, can't continue. They can't. There's no way to actually make it happen, no matter what their intentions are. Now, <coughs> Tizen and Plasma Mare have a similar issue right now. Let's, let's look at Plasma and Mare. Uh, how many people have looked at, say, Plasma Active running on a mobile? You can get a, a copy of it and put it on, uh, on like your, your N7. It's a, great, it's a great little environment, so you get you know, full KDE, basically, in a touch environment on your mobile devices. Great. You can't go to a Best Buy or a Fry's and buy it. Now, I'm not saying that's the end-all, be-all of uh, whether or not a mobile platform is successful, but it is. <laughs> the problem is, it's not, it's not hitting that point. It's not hitting that point where it's actually taking off. We don't need any of these platforms to be 80% market share. We don't need them to compete with iOS or with Android. We simply need them to sell just enough to maintain development, to pay for a couple of guys like Fedora over there to make it happen. I'm going to put my hat on. Yeah, put your hat on. <laughs> <laughs> I brought that. Uh, now, a bunch of touch. Let's look at that for a second. Canonical says we're going to have uh, basically a, a version of Ubuntu with the Unity shell on top of it for mobile devices, tablets, phones. This is great. This is great. But really, in a lot of ways, we don't exactly have the best track record here, right? <coughs> Canonical is a great company. I'm a huge fan. Huge fan. They do great work, just like I am with most of these software companies. They're great, great people, great work. However, remember the the slide about Wayland a while back, that I had the quote from the Fedora guy. I just tweeted you the full context. It's a pretty bad poll you did there. And I did that on purpose. <laughs> but Canonical made the same sort of announcement. They were going to roughly one year from 2010. They were thinking, OK, that's the point that we'll start switching to Wayland. A complete major change. Never happened. Then they changed their mind a little bit. There's a lot of waffling, a lot of back and forth. And that's not Canonical's fault. They're a company. They need to change with the times. They need to modify their plans to actually accomplish what their goals are. Their goals are make a profit. So if this Ubuntu touch isn't at the point where we're making, they're making a profit, their plans will change. I'm not saying we all need to rush out and buy anything that comes out with a Ubuntu touch. But kind of, right? Unless we do something like that, it's not going to succeed. Now, the same is true. Someone you mentioned Firefox OS, right? Now, we've got the same thing. You can order Firefox OS phone. Yes, there are. There are uh, Geek's phone is yeah. uh, okay. selling Firefox OS developer phones, right? I heard they sold out. They sold out already? Yeah. So you can. Well, that's good, though. They sold out. There weren't a ton of them for sale, but they sold out, and that's good. Now, again, Firefox OS is more of, you know, it's... Firefox OS is a lot like iPhone, the first generation. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. Does anyone remember when the iPhone came out and we all made fun of it because it couldn't run apps? Yeah. It was just a web browser, and you could create a shortcut on your home screen that was basically a pointer to a web page, and that was, that was apps. And Steve Jobs was like, we don't need freaking apps. We <laughs> and it was ridiculous. We all made fun of them. And then and they were like, oh, yeah, of course we need apps. And then that's when they're successful. Firefox OS is the same thing. They, they are, they, you can't have apps. It's a, it's a, it's a web browser. And it's nice. So it's, it's cool. It's Chrome OS and Firefox. Right, it's Firefox. Yeah. <laughs> it's Chrome OS and Firefox. Yes. So Firefox OS, the idea is that they actually have APIs. There is an API. You can do. There is an API, right. So, but you're still making JavaScript web pages. It's, kind of, it's similar to how iOS was in the original. They had APIs inside the phone. But anyway, the, the point I'm making here with all this is we don't have a track record for success. We have a track record for success on the server. You notice none of these slides have anything to do with Linux on the server or supercomputers because we kick ass there. We rule. There's no one that can even pretend to challenge us. When Steve Ballmer gets up and talks about Windows supercomputer clusters, everyone's like, is there like a bagel card or something? They just walk away. It doesn't make any sense. Obviously, Linux is not only the king, it's mega king. Now, on the desktop, in a lot of ways, we're doing better, right? But it, we can use a lot of different types of desktops and use them pretty well. But in mobile space, we have no track record for success. None. 
Also, don't forget that GNOME is targeting tablets and phones. You know, like okay, I should have almost put GNOME shell up on here as well. Has anyone put GNOME shell on the phone and tried to click activities? I'm yes, sure I mean, it does work. So I put it on an 87 tablet GNOME shell. But here's the thing, but it can be. Okay, it can be. These technologies that these are based on are all perfectly good. All of these have huge benefits, and none of them made them. And that sucks so much. It sucks so much. And that's where we're at with that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you guys have actually had driver problems over the last couple of, couple of years? Okay, a significant amount. The first year I did this, Everyone raised their hands and half the people threw chairs at me. <laughs> <laughs> things have changed a lot. Even in Fedora, things have changed I, a lot. I got this. It's now the Ubuntu Developer Edition laptop. Ubuntu runs out of the box. I put Fedora 19 out. And it runs good? Everything works. Bingo. It was so Fedora. It wasn't intended necessarily to work on the hardware. Fedora. It runs good. <laughs> this is kind of where we're at. Most hardware. So this is a Lenovo, when I'm running this off of here, is a little touchscreen Lenovo. It's got a touchscreen on it, a really weird Wi-Fi chip. It's got all sorts of stuff. Everything works out of the box. Sousa, Fedora, <coughs> Ubuntu, everything. It wasn't even that hard to get Arch running on here with touchscreen. Like, I mean, a little hard, but, but that's, <laughs> that's Arch, right? Like, I do sign up for that. But everything <laughs> works really well. And this is a stupid, weird piece of hardware. And it works really well. We don't have the problems we used to have. When I sat down to do this, this set of slides for Sucks, I started looking through uh, last year's slides. The first 11 slides, I think, were about, oh my gosh, X11's broken. Oh my gosh, driver problems. Oh my gosh, binary blobs. None of those are really, really that big of problems anymore. We solved them. We have solved these problems. And here's, as a casual observer, here's what I've noticed. We got bored. <laughs> it's funny, but I don't think I don't think it's entirely untrue. When you look at look at the success that Ubuntu has had, look at where they were at on that chart. Where is that? Oh, 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 I'll just skip out of this. But look at the sales. Or look at the uh, the raw numbers here. There we go. Look at that. Look at the dip that they experienced. Now that's not because this is great. That's not because Fedora sucked their user base away. It's because they got bored. They changed what was broken. And now, granted, the dip around 2006, that's a little different. But, but as, as it goes forward, things are dipping because things are, things are changing. And look at Unity. How many people switched away from Ubuntu when Unity came out? I, I did for a while. You weren't sure. You did for a while, then you went back? Yeah. So, so again, this is what's happening. Now, was Ubuntu broken? Was GNOME 2 Ubuntu broken? Was it impossible to do the things they wanted to do with that? No. No, it wasn't. And again, don't mean to harsh on Ubuntu, but they're the big dog in the room in a lot of ways in this case. But they got bored. They solved, they solved the driver issues, just like the Susan Fedora and everyone else did. The driver issues were gone. Stability issues are gone. Our performance is incredible. We're getting more and more software. The software centers and, and app stores start showing up. So what do we do? We replace our display server. We replace our desktop environment. Look at Mate. Look at freaking Mate. They forked all of GNOME 2, renamed it all basically Mate 2, so instead of like the GNOME text editor, you have Mate text editor. I don't mean that to harsh on Mate. Well, I kind of do a little bit of Mate caught up. But <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work solving problems that simply don't exist. They, we made those problems up. You could make the argument that that's not a bad thing which I may do in this next session. <laughs> but the reality is, what would you rather have? Would you rather have a system that works great and you know you can depend on for years to come, or would you rather see them break the hell out of everything every couple of years to the point where you feel so bitter about it that you jump over to Fedora? <laughs> 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 That's kind of where we're at. That's where we're at in 2013. We've solved the technical problems. The problems that we have now are people problems. The problems that we have now are planning, organization, communication. 
the projects, these projects that are working, they're not only not working together, they're making grand statements. The, cin the Cinnamon and Linux Mint guys are like, man, those gnome show guys are jerkwads. And it's annoying. It's annoying that we have that sort of problem right now. Right now, when we're on the cusp of kicking so much butt, that's the problem that we're up against. So that's where we're at. That's, could be worse, right? Could be a lot worse. But it still sucks. That's where we're at.